Hello YouTube, this is Morgan, Airspeed Prime here at my next Avatar Weekly Discussion Topic video. And today's video is going to be the next part of my Best Bender Fighter Discussion Series. This video is going to be the final part of this series where I use the short lists that I've already made for each element and break that down into an end top 20 overall best bender list. So very quickly, before we get into that, let's quickly run down what exactly we're kind of trying to do here. When are we including the avatars and what's going on? So what I'm first going to do here is that we're effectively going to be making two lists within this video. The first list is going to be just from the direct... Um, four short lists for each element that we have we're going to be making a top 20 bender of one element list and then then we'll use that end 20 list and see where certain avatars would place so but at the end of the video we'll also have a bender list that includes avatars and of course the key rule with regards to avatars is that we're not including the avatar state we are just rating those characters as standard benders of four elements and not really putting too much uh, kind of uh, not not putting a lot of credit on their avatar state feats for that in the, for that situation so that's the way it's going to be I, I think it would be unfair to just immediately bring the avatars in and just dismiss most of the benders from like the bottom of these individual lists so just for the sake of fairness and the sake of making it, i think the list more interesting because i think arguably the individual bender list is a little more interesting than what we're eventually going to have with the um avatars so up on screen here you can see what we've done already in this series the first three videos in this series this is what we got the first two the first video we did the water list and the air list and then third video we did the fire list and the fourth video we did earth so first things first what do we have to do here we've got 27 characters here listed up on screen we're looking for a top 20 list the first thing we have to do is eliminate seven seven that aren't going to make the top 20 list. The easiest way to do that, of course, is that the bottom, number 27, is going to be one of the bottom of the, this list. So, for the sake of making this uh, you know, not massively long, we're just going to pretty quickly go through this. So, I think immediately we have to take Janora out. I think she's one of the first ones that drops off. It's like Janora, Mingwa, Combustion Man, Lin. I think Janora drops off early... Uh, because one, we don't have a lot of you know, you know scenes of her fighting a lot, and as good as I think she is, I don't think she is like quite most powerful fighting bender that we have. Her skills, her like advanced skills, kind of lie elsewhere, and she is an advanced airbender, but I don't rate her as highly that like I think she like is the twentieth best bender in the series. I think she'll get to that point, but right now. Not quite good enough. So, Janor drops off the list. Um, equally, I think Afiko drops off the list at this point as well. Um, as I said, we should always note the fact that he is the first guy who ever did the pulling air out of people's lungs technique. He is a master airbender. He has the arrow tattoos. And as far as we were aware, participated in a good few battles during the early stages of the war. And um, proved himself very good in battle. So this guy is really good. We just don't have a ton of knowledge about how exactly he fought. So I rate him lowish, but I th I still think he's worth noting as one of the more powerful airbenders that we've ever seen in the Avatar universe. So Apico drops off. So that's two out of seven that are not making the list. From there, obviously the bottom of our list now is um we have Zaheer is now the bottom of the airbender list. We have Mingwa for waterbending, Combustion Man for fire, and Lin for earth. Um, I think we drop Mingwa off at this point. Uh, I really do. In terms of reaction to my previous couple of videos, the only real debates were that people were thinking uh, Mingwa had a Paku and then Zuko had a Mako. They were the only real two like debates that were really had in the comment section. I, I didn't feel that anyone made a point, like, good enough to really justify why it should be switched. It was kind of more like, Mingwa has a unique style, so she goes ahead. You know, Zuko is, 
you know, has more training, so he goes ahead. Whereas I don't think training matters all that much. And then I think I've explained before, but I don't think Mingwa's style is just this amazing thing that means that she's just so much more powerful than everyone else. I think the absolute masters of waterbending, like the other characters ahead of her on the list, uh, are able to counter that well enough to the to the point where her style isn't all that kind of impressive against them. So Mingwa drops off because uh, I really don't think she makes the list compared to the amount of other characters that we have here. Um, in in terms of like comparing Mingwa against how high does she get up on some of the other lists, I don't think she gets up that high because uh, look how high we rate Mako. He's at least five or six on the Firebender list. Are we saying like she's better than like uh, Tenzin or like is she better than Kavira or Gazan? I don't think so. So I think she is staying like you know in or around you know like twenty one, twenty two, twenty three but not quite good enough. So Mingwa drops off. I also think Lane comes off at this point as well. Um, I just think, like, she is extremely powerful and solid as a fighter. But to me, there's nothing super standout that, like, means that, like, she is just uh, this amazing kind of example of a powerful earthbender she is but i don't think compared to some of the other characters on the list she stands out in that toph is a better version of lin i think su yin is, has kind of better skills than lin and so on i think you know including her on the list we're kind of including a lot of similar characters here and like at this stage on the list i think we have to be just quite brutal and be just like look this this character is good but they're not quite good enough so lin drops off the po- at this point as well um now, so that's uh, three characters. That's four characters gone from the list. Who next? So we have Zahir, Paku, Bolin, and Combustion Man. Who else comes off? Um, I think out of the remainder on the list, I think Zahir drops off at this point. I know. I know a lot of people like like Zahir and they like his fighting style, but he isn't a master bander. He he gets an advantage to a degree because of his flying technique. But as I explained, I think, in detail when I covered air, I don't think flying is that great. So I don't rate the ability to fly, like, hugely amazing just because I feel that the master benders can actually counter it well. And Zaheer's lack of, you know, airbending technique uh, kind of brings him down and he's just kept in play by the fact that he is a very powerful uh, kind of martial artist and has the flying technique. So I think uh, Zaheer drops off at this point, um, which means we're go- running very low in airbender characters at this point. Um, then I think Paku goes next. Um, I, I, I want to note him as just being this really, really good old master of waterbending who really represents someone who is just so, so much experience with his element. Um, I just, the only criticism you could have of him is is kind of just that we didn't see him fight enough and perhaps he is too kind of entrenched perhaps just in the northern style. He's maybe not as kind of open like Katara to learning new styles and that perhaps holds him back against some of the very specialized and kind of you know, unique prodigal benders that are left on the list. So we'll note Paku here but we will unfortunately get rid of him so that means we have got rid of six so we have one more character to get rid of um and i think it's one of those things where like this is the tough one now we have one character to get rid of but i don't really feel like i want to get rid of any of them because i feel like combustion man needs to be on the top 20 list as one of our two combustion menders, even though I, I I have big criticisms of his fighting style and stuff like that, I feel just the power, the sheer power of his element uh, and his bending style keeps him in. Unalog, I think, absolutely deserves a spot on the list, so I don't really feel like he comes off at this point in time. Bolin and Lava Bender, I do rate quite highly, even though I think I very fairly kind of put him lower down than perhaps you know he maybe could be. So I think he deserves a spot on the list. And then there's Gyatso, who is a master airbender. You know, like, he's one of Aang's teachers. We just, I don't think, saw him fight enough. I, I'm almost feeling like it has to be Gyatso that goes off. Just because, you know, we have specialized benders uh, here. 
um, characters who have fought a lot more than this guy, and he is kind of here primarily on the legend of his character. So I think, to be fair, it has to be Gyatso that comes off. Even though, like, realistically, when you do the matchups, you know, Gyatso versus Bolin, potentially Gyatso has an advantage because he's just, you know, he's the old master in a way of airbending. Um, but, you know, how does Gyatso handle a lava bender and, and so on? We, we're not really sure. So, because there's a lot of unknown factors with Gyatso, I think we have to take him off. So, I think that brings us down to uh, as much as we need. Yes, so that's 5 plus 1 is 6, 6 plus 8 is 14, 14 plus 6, 20. So, we have 20 characters here. So, just let's, let's just quickly run down this before we move on to starting to place these characters in the top 20. These are, in my opinion, the top 20 individual benders of an element in Avatar. Uh, Amon, Yakon, Tarlok, Katara, Unalok, Tenzin, Iro, Azula, Pali, Ozai, Mako, Zuko, Zhang Zhang, Combustion Man, Toph, Bumi, Kuvira, Gazan, Su Yin, and Bolin. I think that is a exceptional list. I think that they're characters who we all, I think, know how powerful they are, and I think none of these characters feel like they should just be flat out removed from any of these lists. It's it's a it's a bit frustrating, of course, that we only have one Airbender, but given the nature of the plot of the show and the whole Last Airbender aspect, and then even seventy years on, there not being too many more master level Airbenders, it makes sense that someone like Tenzin is the only Airbender representative. In a few more years' time, when a lot of the other characters get older, like Kai and Opal, I think we have much more airbender representation on the list. But for now, we move into our top 20. So, how do we go about doing this? I think we have to do it kind of in roughly the same way, except this time we can now go from either the top of these lists or the bottom. And the the meaning behind that is obviously that the number one bender, in my opinion, is either going to be Amon, Tenzin, Iroh, or Toph. So we can decide between all those characters like, okay, who's number one, and then we can gradually go down as we shorten the list down. Uh, We'll get there eventually, but um, uh, I think we'll we'll get the number one before we get like the number nine and ten. It's going to be another tricky one for sure. Hmm. Okay, so um, let's start with number 20. So... We're either placing Combustion Man, Unalok, Tenzin, or Bolin at the number 20 slot. I don't think Tenzin belongs down here, so I think we're saving him for probably a little high up in the list. I don't think he's going to make like the top 5, but he's going to be in or around there, I think. So Tenzin, I think, is we're not really looking at kind of, kind of placing this low on the list. So Unalok, Combustion Man, or Bolin. I Equally, I think Unalok is a character who I would place kind of somewhat similar in power level to Tenzin, if a little bit higher. We'll see when we get there what exactly happening here. So, Combustion Man or Bolin? Um, I think Book 4 Bolin beats Combustion Man. I think the combination of how strong he is in normal earthbending plus the accuracy and how he handled uh, little sparring kind of sessions in groups against kind of Pali... Bolin, I think, has a good matchup against Combustion Man, and the Lava Bending is just an extra plus, that he can stop Combustion Man from uh, getting different perch positions to get on him because of how destructive it is. I think Bolin absolutely is ahead of Combustion Man, so that means that Combustion Man comes in at the number 20 slot, and I think that's very fair. I think he represents this character who is here on power alone, purely on his Combustion Bending, And more or less all of the other aspects of him aren't very strong. But just because of how powerful Combustion Bending is, he gets a spot on this list. And I think that is... um, It's very telling about how powerful the the specialized bending techniques actually are. So now, uh, as I said, uh, we're kind of looking at Zhang Zhang next in the firebending list for the number 19 slot. Um, So we're kind of thinking, okay, Tenzin and Unalak, I think we're still... We're still placing ahead of these characters here. So, is it Zhang Zhang or Bolin for the 19 spot? Um, again, I think I'm perhaps underrating Zhang Zhang a bit here, but I think Zhang Zhang comes 19th. Um, because I think Bolin, with the, again, the combination of Earth and Lava, I think he takes it over Zhang Zhang. And as much as I, as I said, I love Zhang Zhang's defensive firebending style and 
how much of an old master he is. I think Bo Lin is just getting towards that point where he is pretty soon hitting his prime and because he has a super rare bending technique I think he takes it over Zhang Zhang so we're gonna place Zhang Zhang at number 19 and uh, from there we move on so this is gonna be a tricky one in that we have now in the firebending uh, bottom of the firebending shortlist is Zuko now do we place Zuko or Bo Lin because I still think Unalak and Tenzin are above Zuko so is Zuko or Bo Lin coming 18th um, I kind of feel like I want to put Bo Lin ahead of Zuko, but I, then I, I think I'm underestimating Zuko, because if, if we're if we're looking a little bit further ahead, Mako's next up on the firebending list at number five. I still think Mako is a little better than Bo Lin, even though Bo Lin has lava bending. I think Mako is just the more intelligent fighter overall, and is just so skilled that I think he would be able to defend quite well because he has lightning in addition to um, fire as well. So they both have like standard bending plus a specialized form. So um, I think it's definitely a tough one because I think Zuko can handle Bolin's normal bending well. It's all about how Zuko would handle the lava bending and if he could do that because because he's up against an earthbender here the lightning redirection doesn't really come into play. So it's purely Zuko on the basis of his firebending going up against Bolin here. So I'm going to I'm going to put Zuko at 18. And I feel really bad about that. But I feel like this is kind of how it has to be. I think it's just unfortunate that just Zuko... Does, is, there's so many other good benders here that he, this is kind of how it has to be. So, um, yeah, we're putting Zuko at 18. But I, I, I'm not sure necessarily how I feel about that. We'll see. We're not gonna like lock in this list just now. We're 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 building a list here, so we'll we'll get we'll get there. So as we say, though, we're placing Bolin at seventeen here because I still think Tenzin and Unalak are a level above a lot of these characters. So we're placing Bolin at seventeen, as we stated. Um, and now we have Su Yin, Mako, Unalak, and Tenzin. This is an interesting one for sure. Um, it's Mako and Su Yin, I think, who are kind of up for debate here for the number 16 slot. Mako versus Su Yin. Um, Su Yin, I think, has a really nice balance between how she uses her earth and how she uses her metal. Uh, she has a lot of experience. But does she quite have the talent, talent level that Mako has? Um, in that, like, Mako has a one-on-one -on -one victory against ming Hua, whereas Su Yin has, like, a two-on-one -on -one victory with her sister against Pali. Like, how do you really rate these characters in terms of their big victories? Um, Su Yin has, like, an experience advantage, but I think Mako is so close to being at his absolute best, his kind of peak potential. Um... I feel he has the skills, the athleticism, the the lightning plus the normal fire that I feel he would actually take Su Yin. So in the in the sake of getting closer towards the top of this list, I'm going to just kind of lock that in for now. So Su Yin at 16, um which means Su Yin comes off the bottom of the earth bending list, um and that leaves Gazan now at the bottom of the uh, earth list. Um so this is where it's interesting. For the number 15 slot, I still think we're talking about Unalak and Tenzin being much higher up. So we're still dealing with kind of uh, getting rid of the kind of earth and fire basically up against each other. Mako or Gazan for 15 slot? I think Gazan has a slight edge here because if you look at the way their fight in book 3 went... Bolin was struggling against Gazan. Gazan had the complete advantage but couldn't quite finish Bolin off. Bolin was just doing enough to stay in that fight. Mako comes in and immediately the tide turns. So he is the deciding factor in how that fight actually comes to an end. But does that speak to how that matchup would go one-on-one? -on -one? I don't think so because I think Bolin was there to kind of help Mako defend against Gazan's lava bending. How would Mako kind of fare on his own? The other factor here is, I don't think Gazan has a great defense against Lightning. I really don't think that that's the case. I think Mako's, uh, Mako has an advantage if he uses Lightning uh, kind of quite effectively. Gazan would have to put up the Earth Walls, and as we've seen, he has a slight... Gazan 
his defenses are a little bit weak, and I think Mako, as we see, can burst through them with his normal fire, and then the lightning, I think, would just kind of help that. Um, but I don't want to overvalue Mako here, so I think again we're we're gonna we're gonna just kind of place a lot of characters here. Uh, just on like initial thoughts and we're, we'll come back and see do we do we like how the list is so that means we're placing Mako at uh, 15 so we're placing Gazan above Mako um, so that means Ozai now comes to the bottom of the firebending list and I still would place Unalak and Tenzin ahead of Ozai uh, as much as as powerful as I think Ozai is he is a little bit of an unknown kind of quantity in terms of what his normal bending style is like, not Sozin's Comet Enhanced. So that needs to be a factor in this as well, in that this is Ozai, a normal but strong firebender who can use lightning generation but has no redirection. Um, Gazan, who is a strong earthbender and lava bender, uh, and I think we're, we're placing Unalak and Tenzin ahead of Gazan, and I think we're placing Unalak and Tenzin ahead of Ozai. So Ozai versus Gazan, I I think this is Ozai again. I I think Ozai comes out below Gazan. I think Gazan beats Ozai. Um, again, it, it's a similar thing with Mako because obviously, um, Mako I I put Mako below Ozai on the firebending list because as much as they kind of have similar skill sets, I think you have to place him ahead because Ozai is kind of more of a kind of much more experienced character because Iroh says that Ozai's roughly on his level um, you have to give some value to Ozai you can't just diminish him and say he's low on the list because um, he's not great he's the final villain of ATLA he is powerful and I think he has a slight power advantage over um, Mako it's, it's, it, it, it's the whole thing with Mako, Zuko and Ozai basically Zuko I think surpasses Mako and Ozai once he gets to his like mid to late twenties, that hasn't happened just yet, and that and I think Ozai being ahead of Mako naturally, I think represents more of kind of where Zuko eventually will be. So, I think I don't think Ozai quite handles Gazan, um, in that yes, he has powerful lightning as well, and he has powerful fire, um, but I. Th- I don't know necessarily how Ozai would handle lava because I don't see Ozai being like the as acrobatic and agile as Mako. I see him being more of a power firebender. So I I see this being kind of a a slugfest uh, bending fight here in that I don't think there's a ton of defense happening in this fight. I think a lot of defense is getting broken through. A lot of hits are happening here. And it's all about who stays in the fight longer. And I think Gazan just has a, a... Gazan just feels a little more lethal with regards to what he can do to the environment and I'd question if Ozai could fully avoid all the lava as much as uh, other characters can so in the f- in the sake of moving on we'll place Ozai at 14 and um, which means Pali comes to the bottom of the firebending list so Pali, Unalak, Tenzin and Gazan again I'm rating Tenzin and Unalak ahead of Pali here I still think they stay higher up on the list than these characters um so Gazan or Pali? I think Pali. I I think you have to give this one to Pali, uh, in that she definitely what she has over Combustion Man in terms of a combustion bender is that she has the ability to arc her combustion blasts. Plus, she's a much 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 better normal firebender. She actually uses her normal firebending in fi- in fighting. She's reasonably agile, and I think she just blows away Gazan's defenses. I think Gazan stays in this fight for a little bit because of forcing Pali to move around with his lava, but I think the combustion just kind of overwhelms Gazan and he doesn't have the greatest defenses. I think he I think he, this is definitely Pali's fight here. So I think at, it's at this point we have to place Gazan. So Gazan comes thirteenth, which is very respectable as our kind of key lava bender character. Um it just like his mentality and stuff like that holds him back again. Like when he when he starts to get on the defensive, he tends to kind of go a bit crazy in fights and kind of almost get himself killed. So that's kind of why I think he comes out lower rather than a lava bender he would expect to be much, much, much higher up. So we get rid of Gazan, which means that Kuvira comes out to the bottom of the Earthbender list. Now we are getting somewhere here. Again, I still rate Unlock and Tenzin higher than Pali. But do how do we rate Pali versus Kuvira? In that 
Kuvira and her style seem very, in a way, suited to tackling Pali in that she's kind of, Kuvira is like a better version of Su Yin who emphasizes metal a bit more. And I just I can just see her doing something like where she fires a metal strip at Pali's face, uh, forehead as she's letting off combustion blast and Pali injuring herself. I can sort of see something like that happening. But again, one on one, how does Kuvira get into posi- a position to actually do that to Pali? Um, so that's an interesting one to think about as well. Uh, and then, like, there's a lot of interesting matchups here with regards to like the. This is where it's starting to get very tough here. Um, in terms of like the the power level of these characters, um, I think at this point we may have to start going filling in the top of the list and then coming down a bit, um, because we're getting it's getting very tricky here, and I think I'm going to spend too much time trying to figure out the exact placement of like twelve, eleven, ten, when I think it's much easier to start filling in from the top and going in towards the middle. So, yeah, well, it's at this point we're going to choose number one. So it's between Amon. Tenzin, Iroh, and Toph. And I think, no question, Amon is number one. Um, And I really don't see any way any other character can be in that spot. Um, Equally, I think Yukon has to be number two. And Tarlok has to be number three. Now, here is what I've been kind of hinting at for a while now. Why, when I did the waterbending list, I immediately placed these three at the top... And why I now immediately place these three at the top of this list. Psychic bloodbending slash the ability to bend without the full moon being out is just such an overpowered ability that it makes any any fight involving these characters, unless it's against each other or the avatar state, very difficult because you kind of just have to give these characters the win by default. Because... When you're doing these matchups, you kind of have to set it up in a very kind of neutral situation. Of like, like, okay, there's at the very least a little bit of every element around to give each character a fair fight. They they start relatively close together, but not super close together. But bloodbending, psychic bloodbending, has such a huge range. Yukon can get everyone in the entire courtroom. Tarlock can do the same thing. Uh, Amon can bloodbend people from high range as well. It's just such a powerful ranged ability. They could have made it somewhat um, like fair if it, if it had a very low range, but it doesn't. It has a huge range, as Yukon, I think, primarily demonstrates. And it's just a case of, like, this fight starts. You know, you, you, you put the flag up to start the fight, and immediately they just look at the character, and they have them under control. And yes, the most powerful of the powerful, the talented, the prodigal benders can break out of a bloodbending grip. But when you break out of someone's bloodbending grip, that doesn't mean you can't be put back into it almost immediately. It means you break out temporarily and you just have to start it up again. The only way to counter this effectively is the Avatar state. Because as far as we're aware, just the Avatar state is so powerful that you can't actually like control someone with bloodbending in the Avatar state. Um, And it's only like really powerful benders like Aang, Mako, uh, Korra that can actually like in any way break out of a bloodbending grip and even then the only chance you have is to finish the fight in the second or two that you have immediately upon breaking out after which you have to still rate the fact that these are all basically master waterbenders who can defend themselves even without their bloodbending like I, I think the likes of like Tarlock perhaps isn't if you take away his psychic bloodbending, he is much lower down on the list. I think he's in or around a Ming Wall level uh, in terms of his normal fighting, but that's fine enough to I think defend for like a couple of seconds against another high level bender enough to give himself a, a bit of space to use his psychic bloodbending again. So it, that's the kind of way that you have to look at these type of characters. Equally with Yakone, even though we don't really see him do a lot of like normal water bending, he is a master just from the fact that he he's powerful enough to teach his kids. Um and the reason that Yukon and Amon are ahead of Tarlock, of course, is because Tarlock doesn't have the psychic aspect of this technique. He he has to use his hands, and that puts him at a slight disadvantage, uh, especially with the Amon Tarlock scene, where Amon can just walk through Tarlock's bloodbending grip because he's a much more powerful bloodbender than he is. Um, Amon can just Im- immediately just break through it, and that's why Tarlock's bottom. 
uh, but I do feel Amon had a more has a more powerful grip than his father. I think that's the whole point of that character is that Amon was a prodigy with the technique, whereas Yukon was kind of like the inventor, the person who came up with the techniques for psychic blood bending. Now, you may then be asking the question of like, okay, what if we then include the ability of normal waterbenders uh, to use blood bending? I see the full moon is out. How does Katara stack up against these characters? I feel if this if the moon was out and Katara had access to her blood bending, I feel she would probably have an advantage, perhaps over Tarlock. Because I think she's a naturally more skilled character. But because, just because of Tarlock's bloodline, you do have to rate him quite highly as a powerful bender in terms of just his the level of technique that he has. I unfortunately don't think Katara stands up well in a bloodbending battle against Amon or Yakon because of their psychic bloodbending. I think it's just that, that powerful. And that is no criticism against Katara because no character except an avatar in the avatar state, stacks up against Amon. And that's just the way it is. Look at the way these three characters were defeated within the show. Tarlock was taken out by his brother, who is the, the mo- number one on the list. It makes sense. Tarlock can be taken out by the two people above him in the avatar state, and that's really about it. How, how was Yakone taken out? By Aang in the avatar state, got his bending taken away. How was Amon taken out? Korra didn't, like, beat him in a bending fight... He thought he had taken her bending away, but didn't realize that she had never actually activated her ability to airbend, so he never blocked it. So when she broke out, he thought he had like a moment because she ha- she has nothing to hit him with unless he gets right up close, unless she gets right up close, and she then revealed that she had unlocked her airbending. It was just a kind of miscalculation from Amon, um, that. He was taken by surprise by an airbending blast. But even then, she didn't like hurt him as such. She just sent him into the water. He got back out and revealed that he's a really powerful normal waterbender and then fled. He was never properly defeated. He was defeated by virtue of the fact that his allies turned against him after that point. Um, So that's an important point to make. That these characters just haven't been defeated in a bending fight. We've never seen someone best psychic bloodbending except the Avatar state. And we're we're ruling that out just because of how powerful it is. So that's my explanation for one, two, three. Why they just instantly, no question, that's why they are in that place. I can perhaps see some sort of a like in certain matchups. You know, Tarlock might go down, like Tarlock versus Pali or even Combustion Man. I can see him maybe not being quite able to get out of the way of a quick combustion blast right at the start of the fight or something like that. I think Tarlock maybe loses. You know. Like, like two, like one in five matches against like a Pali or something like that. But he still overall would take the kind of matchup, you know, you know, best out of five type thing. So that's that. So that means our ones are gone, uh, at least some of them. So we take Tarlock, Yakone, and Amon out from that list, which means that in terms of our number four slot, are we going to place Iro? Katara, Tenzin, or Toph as the number four slot. Um, I think Tenzin doesn't quite rank this highly. I rate him really highly and we'll get into him, but I don't think he's quite this high. Like, the best bender who isn't a psychic blood bender. I don't think that's Tenzin. Is it Katara? I, I think she's in or around the discussion here. I think a little bit ahead of Tenzin. Not quite this high, though. So I think it comes down to Iroh or Toph. And I think you have to give it to Iroh. Because what he has over Toph, as far as we were aware right now, um, is the experience. Now, of course you can rate, you can bring Toph in when she's older in Korra. And she definitely still has a lot of power when she's older. But is she on the level at that age, assuming you know, Toph and Korra is around the same age as... In or around the same age as Iroh in ATLA. I think Toph will be actually a bit older than Iroh was in ATLA. But still, an old, older character, I still would rate Iroh a bit higher. So even with the extra experience, I think Iroh takes it. Just because I think he represents so much about what fire is. He has all of the techniques that are not like exclusive to like bloodlines, basically. He has all of those techniques. Like The only like things we haven't really seen him do are combustion bend and do the heat redirection thing but then even then the fact that he can like heat up water and tea with um, his bending and do the dragon breath and has dragon fire 
that speaks to how powerful he is. He knows the kind of philosophical, philo- philosophical side of firebending really well. Is powerful. Has proven himself against strong benders. Um, is the leader of one of the group of like amazing benders. The Order of White Lotus. I think he has to be number four. I think it's just very little question that like Iroh taking away the super crazy powerful techniques in Avatar realistically represents the best of the best in terms of a bender for me. So that's why I rate him that highly. So next up, who do we place at this point? So we're we're running very low here. We're down to our last kind of eight at this point. So yeah, let's try and pick our number five from here. So looking at the top of what we have left in the lists, um, we have Katara, Tenzin, Azula, and Toph. I think, I think Toph is the most standout of who's left. I think Azula pushes Toph close, but I think, I think realistically, it is fair to say Toph probably comes next. I think she is just that powerful. I think most represents like the power of Earthbending. I think she is just so 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 strong, and that I think she probably comes next. So I'm going to I'm going to put Toph here as number 5 on our list. Um in that I don't think many characters kind of beat her. Like I think the Psychic Bloodbenders take her out. I think Iro I think probably would win a fight between the two, but it would be very very close. Um but I I I do think with Toph it is fair to say that she does actually have a, a weakness as a character. Airbenders. I think Airbenders like counter Toph really really well. In that, like, I think Toph versus Tenzin. I think Tenzin wins that fight. Like, Ang versus Toph, Ang wins. Um, I think Zaheer beats Toph because uh, I think flying is, like, the perfect counter to um, Toph. Perhaps, you know, if, if Zaheer didn't immediately go for the flying, if he did stay on the ground a little bit more, he may not have the same advantage as other airbenders over Toph. But I still think airbenders are some of the few characters who can actually take advantage of the fact that Toph is blind and I think that is important to note in that like even though I'd say Tenzin beats Toph I don't think it's really fair to say that Tenzin is ahead of Toph on the most powerful bender list. Tenzin wins that fight because he kind of counters Toph quite well not necessarily because his power level is higher and it's one of the few kind of times when I think it's probably actually like fair to kind of use that kind of comparison in that like the direct you know fight versus fight isn't necessarily the best way to judge this. So I think Toph comes out here, and it's uh, very very uh, fair to say that. So number six, uh, Boomy Azula Katara Tenzin. I think the thing here is. With Bo- does Boomy like come ahead of Azula and ahead of Katara or what? Because I think with Boomy, it's one of those ones where it's either it's, I think it's very hard to really get Boomy right in terms of where you rate him. I think it's very easy to undervalue Boomy and say, oh, he's just a normal Earthbender; he doesn't have any of the special techniques. But then you have to say he is like the master of normal Earthbending. He may not have metal um, or lava. But he is the master of normal earth. The amount of earth he can get moving when he wants to is amazing. You, I don't think you can really use his age as a disadvantage against him because he doesn't seem like he has like stamina problems or lot. Like he's really struggling because of his age. He seems in amazing condition for how old he is. Um, I, I, I don't. He has the whole neutral Jing thing. He waits. He, he's not overly aggressive. He's not overly defensive. He can do both very well. He has tons of experience. I think he just, kind of like in an Iro way, except for Earth, represents all of the key aspects in that, like, even though he doesn't have the special technique, he just perfectly encapsulates what an Earthbender, I think, is meant to be. That I don't see Katara being able to take Boomy, and I don't really see Azula being able to take uh, uh, Boomy either. Just because... Like, what is Azula going to be doing against, like, that much Earth coming at her? At her? I think Boomy maybe struggles a little bit against Lightning and that he has to just directly, like, really heavily defend against that. Um, and Katara, of course, would have a few moves and is perhaps, like, quicker than him. But I, I, I would struggle to see, like, perhaps how she would... 
if Katara could generate the power necessary to break through the kind of crazy earth shields that Boomy could kind of bring into play, she can heal herself, I suppose, to stay in the fight. But I think on just sheer raw power, I think Boomy actually comes number six. Um, and I think that's fair to say because he just has demonstrated so many powerful applications of his uh, bending that he kind of just has to be placed here. Um and I think I do think part of that is just that we haven't seen Katara or Azula in their primes. Them in their primes, it, it'll be it'll be interesting to to judge that fight again in terms of like twenty five year old Azula, twenty five year old Katara versus Boomy. Like they're they're much more comfortable with their bending, much more able to generate the the chi necessary to do the really really powerful attacks and maybe counter some of Boomy's big attacks that he can generate with ease because of how long he's been using his techniques so um i think that's that's a i think that's a fair placement for boomy that he deserves to be represented quite highly on the list because he is absolutely one of the best kind of living bending characters that we have left uh, i'm surprised the comics haven't really touched on him at all and i, I really am interested to see how like when exactly he died and stuff like that it, there's a lot of questions about boomy just in terms of canon stuff like what's up with him but um yeah so we have seven to twelve those are the spots that we have to fill out um and it's definitely getting tough at this point so number seven do we place katara tenzin azula or kuvira at number seven um i probably would at the very least rate katara and azula above Kuvira. I think the Tenzin Kuvira fight is one I will have to get into. So Katara or Azula. I think it's one of those ones where Azula is the more prodigal, the probably the the more naturally talented bender of the two. But Katara counters Azula very well. Um Yes, in Sozin's Comet, like, there was a huge power disadvantage, and kind of Katara took advantage of the fact that Azula wasn't thinking as much. But even in the, the book 2 finale, Azula was kind of struggling against Katara one-on-one. -on -one. It was a struggle until, like, Zuko was interfering in kind of b between fights, and the, the fight got kind of mixed up uh, away from the two one-on-one -on -one fights and became sort of two-on-two. -on -two. That's when um, Azula and Zuko took the advantage over Katara and Aang. Like, Katara seemed to have Azula kind of handled. That Azula potentially maybe struggles a little bit against, a little bit against waterbenders. So, um, it, it's definitely a difficult one to rate. It's probably like Katara is like very close to her prime now, performing at her best. Azula probably has a higher kind of peak. Um, but I think for now, I am going to rate Katara above Azula. So, Katara at number 7 here i think is a is a is a fair positioning for her um just look at the quality of the crazy powers and just amazing representatives of their element and that like yes katara is the fourth placed waterbender on the list but the f the first normal waterbender basically on the list i think in terms of raw waterbending skill if you take away psychic bloodbending from mon yuko and tarlock i think katara wins that and she's ahead of those three um, like if you ha if you had to like disqualify psychic bloodbending from this list because it's unfair, like the Avatar state, she's number four overall on the list. Uh, Iro, Toph, Boomy, Katara, um, Amon probably stays on the top twenty list uh, if you take away psychic bloodbending and probably comes in and around you know maybe like fifteen, sixteen, maybe like fourteen, thirteen, something like that. But we're that's not really what we're doing here right now. So yeah, we're placing Katara at number seven. And then Unalak comes up. And I, th I think Azula takes Unalak. I think that's a, a fair thing to say. I think Azula beats Kavira. Uh, Azula's better than Tenzin. So I think very fairly Azula comes in at number 8 here. But 8 and 7 you could probably swap around very reasonably with no real issue there. So, and then we're down to the last four. Last four characters to place. Unalak, Tenzin, Pali, and Kuvira. This is getting very, very tricky. Um, in terms of like what to do here, um, let's see where we're looking at. Where where do we fill in? Like who between these four, who is the best? Um, hmm, it's interesting because I feel Tenzin and Unalak handle Pali okay. 
Kavira maybe struggles a bit, but I think ultimately maybe takes the fight against Pali as well. So does Pali come out bottom? I'm not entirely sure here. This is definitely the tricky bit. We're right in the middle of the list here. How do we really sort this out? I think the worst is probably the bad way to do it. Let's see, who are the best? I don't think Unalak's the best of these guys. Oh, I, I know. I rate the I rate a lot of these characters very on par. Um, I'd say Un, Unalak is slightly ahead of Tenzin. I think they very much represent. I think the same take on their bending form, and that like I feel they're like in or around the same age. Um, Unalak probably has a, a slightly more you know more power just because of the spiritual connection to his element that he also has. Um. But I'm I'm kind of wondering, am I overrating Unalak here? I'm I'm really struggling here <laughs> to figure this out. Really, really struggling here at this point. Um, oh my word, what do I do here? I th- I think the best way to do this is to really address Pali and how other candle uh, characters handle Pali because K- Pali is the is the last remaining person on the list with a special bending power, and. It, it's at this point I think it's, it's it's important to know how more how powerful is that versus these other very strong characters. So I think Tenzin handles Pali actually quite well. I think he just has the agility because he's an airbender, the ability to dodge her very effectively, and I think he ultimately would be able to get within her range, get her up close, and I think naturally Tenzin is a better standard bender of his element than Pali is a standard firebender. I think the airbending just beats Pali up close. So I think Tenzin ahead of Pali is for sure um, the the way that I want to do that. Um, then it's all about the other two in that Kuvira. How does Kuvira versus Pali go? Um, in that we saw that Lin and Su Yin were able to take down Pali. And Kuvira is a very similar fighter to both of those characters. But do you say that she takes it um, even though it required two people? Like, is Kuvira equal to Su and Lin? I, I don't think that's quite fair to say. I think Kuvira handles Pali okay, but I don't know if she quite manages to win that fight, you know, completely in that sense. Um, at the same time, I feel like I don't want to undervalue uh, Kuvira at the same time. So right now my thoughts are that Kuvira perhaps doesn't take Pali and kind of comes in a bit below. And then Unalak is the hard one, I think. Because he is a master waterbender. He can handle himself in a waterbending fight. He beats Tonrock, who's a very powerful waterbender. I think the fact that, you know, that Ming Wah is in the Red Lodge group, but he is the higher ranking member, I think that speaks to the fact that he is a much more powerful waterbender than she is. And we've seen that just from the the fact that he le- he's he is a character who has also invented a waterbending technique. Iroh has invented a firebending technique. Unlock has invented a waterbending technique. I think it is fair to put him somewhere on that level as a character. That he is one of our best waterbenders that we see. I know not a lot of people like like him, appreciate him all that much as a character necessarily. But his fighting skills, I don't think have been put have ever been like diminished all that much that he does handle himself quite well in 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 fights i i think that's very fair to say so um does he go ahead of everyone i think he handles Pali quite well even though i think waterbending has a quite weakish matchup against um Pali, I think he just is so knowledgeable about other bending styles being a part of the red lotus knowing Pali so well I think he, he knows how to take on a combustion bender. I think it, he handles the, the fight well enough. So he's ahead of Pali. And I think Tenzin versus Unalak is a very interesting fight. Ultimately, I would say Unalak takes it because I think he is definitely presented as just being this very tricky character that he would do some things that Tenzin doesn't quite expect. It would be a tough fight. It would be, it'd be very, very close. But I think... Unalak would take it. So, right now, based on that ordering, that would place Unalak as number 9, Tenzin as number 10, 
Pali at 11. And Kuvira at 12. How does that look? That's an interesting one. So number one, Amon. Number two, uh, Yukon. Number three, Tarlock. Four, Iroh. Five, Toph. Six, Boomy. Seven Katara, eight Azula. I don't think there's. I don't think I have too much problem with the top eight. Maybe you can switch Azula and Katara depending on if you feel the fact that Katara counters Azula so well justifies her being placed higher on like a power ranking uh, kind of system. Um, but still, the, uh, I'm happy with those uh, those being the specific characters included within the top eight, if, even if the order isn't perhaps perfect. Going from the bottom up. I think Combustion Man is is, is fine at, at, at twenty. Uh, Zhang Zhang nineteen, eighteen Zuko. You know, it it gets a little bit kind of tricky there in around you know eighteen to fifteen in that like. Yes, um, I I I think what I what I, I think the only problem that I maybe have looking at this is like Su Yin. Something within my head always makes me think like. Why is Su Yin in there? But then I, I do realize when you look at the fights that she's in, she is excellent and she does justify her place on the list. That I explain in good detail, I think, why I placed Bolin below Su Yin. And then because uh, I rated uh, Mako, I think Mako is better than Bolin. I, I think the, the order, that's the way it kind of has to be. Um. Ozai, I think it's it's fine where he's placed Gazan. It is very much the 9, 10, 11, 12. I'm not entirely sure about that. Ultimately, it's the r- right middle of the list. It's so close. The places are basically exchangeable. I'm not entirely sure if that's the perfect ranking. But I think right now, I think I'm, I'm fine with that. I think I'm actually okay with how that is. Like, I, th- I think that as my top 20 list is perfectly fine. So, let's quickly go through it one last time. Number one, Amon. Number two, Yakone. Number three, Tarlock. Four, Iroh. Five, Toph. Six, Boomy. Seven, Katara. Eight, Azula. Nine, Unalak. Ten, Tenzin. Eleven, Pali. Twelve, Kuvira. Thirteen, Gazan. Fourteen, Ozai. Fifteen, Mako. Sixteen, Suyin. Seventeen, Bolin. Eighteen, Zuko. Nineteen, Zhang Zhang. And twenty, Combustion Man. I think that is very very reasonable the way I, I did that list I don't feel I overrated any of the characters who had super strong techniques I think I justified why the psychic blood be- blood be- bloodbenders lock at the top of the list I I would think of, I think it's very fair to Pali in terms of rating her above a lot of characters but justifying why I feel other characters could beat her um and then saying that Bolin as like an inexperienced lava bender is placed lower down goes on higher up but I still feel other characters have a good counter to lava bending um, given Gazan's weaknesses as a kind of personality type I suppose so that's the bending list the individual bending list no character on that list can bend two different elements so now for the avatars and uh, yeah the avatars we're going to be keeping in mind for this are basically the named ones that we know so they are Korra Ang. Roku, uh, Kyoshi, Kurok, Yang Chen, and Wan. I'm not counting Avatar Jafar, even though we assume he's perhaps a lava bender. We don't know enough about him. We don't even know if that's his name. Uh, we're not counting the uh, Avatar that Hundun fought because we learn absolutely nothing about that Avatar except that he won that fight, and that doesn't tell us really anything. So that's that. Then. I think the only real thing in terms of trying to add the avatars into our list that we already have is to basically split up the avatars based on basically kind of groups. And what I'm doing here is I'm separating Ang, Korra, and Wan from Roku, Kiyoshi, Koruk, and Yang Chen. Because for me, Roku, Kiyoshi, Koruk, and Yang Chen are all avatars who get to the point of being like 100% fully realized as an avatar. Now, admittedly, Koruk dies quite young, I think just very soon after becoming a fully realized avatar, but at the same time, they are our kind of, like, oldest avatars that we actually get to see in action to a degree. So they kind of represent what an avatar is at their kind of peak. 
Now, you can bring in other stuff like the fact that Korra is the only avatar who, as far as we were, has, like, metal bending. And, like, Aang is the only one who has energy bending, even though Korra has some aspects of energy bending. You know, s- stuff like that you can bring in that, like, Aang and Wan have dragon fire bending. And that's all cool. But I'm specifically saying that, kind of, for the purpose of this list, I am actually rating Roku, Kyoshi, Kuruk, and Yang Chen higher than Aang, Korra, and Wan. Because for the purpose of this, I'm saying that with Wan, I'm not putting him in the same category as the other ones because he is the first Avatar. And because of the era that he comes from, I don't think you can just say that he is immediately one of the most powerful benders of all time. Because... Yes, you probably would say that for firebending. You have to rate his firebending skills very highly because he learned directly from the dragons and in many ways is the originator in terms of he's the first human to learn the true style of firebending. And that's a really cool thing to give him. He is the Oma, basically, for firebending. And that's great. But, as far as we're aware, he didn't learn the true styles of the other elements. He didn't learn from the Badger Moles, he didn't learn from the Sky Bison, and he didn't learn from the Push and Pull of the Moon. So you have to say that to a degree, Wan's other elements outside of fire aren't as strong as the other characters, even though he has good martial arts skills, and I suppose could apply some of his knowledge from learning from the dragons to the other elements in terms of trying to create a style with them. I still think you have to say that he is probably weaker than the other avatars, just kind of on the basis of that. Um, he's a, he's a good athlete and stuff like that, but you have to say like his bending style, his technique, uh, and kind of power level to a degree wouldn't be as high as some of the other ones. So one for me technically is going to be the lowest ranked avatar. Um, and then Korra and Aang, I think you have to rate slightly lower than the other ones because they haven't hit their prime yet. That I don't think it is, a, is really fair to say that, like, in the comics, like, 14, 15 year old Aang is the same level as, like, Roku as we see him in the past, as Kyoshi in the past, even Kuruk or Yang Chen. I don't think we can really say that. Korra is a bit of a, a closer story in that I think it's a much fairer thing to say that she is close. But she's only like 21. I don't think she's quite hit her peak. I think she still has a ways to go with certain elements in terms of using them effectively. But again, like I, like I said with a lot of these characters, it's when they're in or around 25, 27, 30. That's when they're at their peak. And so that's what I'm saying. Like Kurok probably just about hit his peak just prior to his death. So uh, what we're going to be doing for the sake of this list is basically no one is going to get in between uh, Roku, Kyoshi, Kurok, and Yang Chen. We're basically placing those four as a group because I'm not distinguishing really between them at all in the sense of like, I'm going to order them based on how I feel, how powerful they are, but no character is going to go in between the other avatars. So, where do I place them? I think the only fair place to place these fully realized avatars is directly below Tarlock. So four, five, uh, six, and seven are are fully realized avatars. So uh, I'm placing Kyoshi at four because I think she's presented as the most physically imposing uh, kind of character. The fact that she lived for so long, 230 years, she in her past dealt with the most kind of issues and probably had the most battles, trained the most people. She seemed like the most kind of action focused avatar and. Just because of that, I'm rating her as kind of like the most powerful bender, just because it seems like she kind of had that aura about her, that like anyone who messed with her was getting hurt, and I think that's fair to say. I, I place Roku as the second of these ones, so Roku's number five on the list, um, uh, just because I feel like we saw a good amount of his training, we saw a decent amount of his power against Sozin, who himself is a very powerful firebender, and so I rate him there. Korok we didn't really see fight, but I rate slightly above Yang Chen just because, um, no, no, sorry, sorry, not, not Korok. Yang Chen I rate above Korok because Yang Chen at the very least fought General Old Iron and proved herself very well in that fight, and that was the main fight of her time as the Avatar. Korok, though, as far as we were aware, we didn't really see fight. 
it's implied that he potentially died in like the spirit world fighting Ko or something like that, but we don't really know. But I still think that's the best way to take it. And the reason I place all of these characters below the Psychic Bloodbenders is because for the same reason as like the likes of like Iroh I feel lose to these characters is the same reason that the Avatars lose. They don't, without their Avatar state, they don't have a counter for Psychic Bloodbending. And uh, as much as they have so much power and could potentially you know, get back into the fight if they ever broke out of psychic bloodbending, I still feel that it's just a matter of time before they're put back in it. Um, And that's no discredit to any of these avatars. It's just that that is how powerful psychic bloodbending is. I rate them all above, like, every other bender because I think that's the way we're meant to take the fully realized avatar. That, to me, a fully realized avatar is basically Paku, Bumi, Gyatso and Zhang Zhang in one person. Some of the best of the best, maybe not the ultimate bender of every single element, but right up there with the best. And that's who they are within one person for every single element. That, like, Iroh is perhaps a better firebender than every avatar ever, but the fact that they can counter his maybe increase in firebending by just using different elements and combinations of elements that gives them an advantage in that sense Toph I think is a better earthbender than any avatar ever realistically but again the fact that the the, the, the avatars could use airbending to counter her blindness is a really good, good thing that they have there and, and, and so on I think that that's just the idea of the avatar they have a counter to everything and even though they're not the absolute best they are still in that like excellent bordering on top level tier um so that's where i'm rating these characters um and then it comes down to where am i placing Anne, cora and juan i'm placing um iro at eight so iro directly below the four avatars we've just placed i'm placing toff at next then boomy at 10 then i'm placing cora so cora comes in with only three benders I think ahead of her and they are Iroh, Toph and Boomy and I think that's a very fair placement for her as like an avatar who is not quite yet in her prime but is just about there I still feel like the sheer mastery of an Iroh the sheer power of a Toph the sheer power of a Boomy have a slight edge on Korra even though Korra has all of the the different variables with the different elements that she can use I still feel the sheer specialization of these characters and how much they represent their element gives them a slight edge over Korra even though she has all of her those techniques and I don't think there's any discredit to Korra she's an amazing character I rate her ahead of Aang here who's the next on the list Korra is such a physical avatar in terms of she can do good hand-to-hand combat, she can take hits and continue to fight, Um, she's very combat bending focused and I think she probably in her prime maybe jumps up to in around Kyoshi tier, probably ahead of her in terms of a combat specialist avatar because she also has metal bending as well. So she has such a high potential to be one of the most powerful avatars of all time. I think it's absolutely justified why... um, for now, I'm placing her here, but that Iroh, Toph, Boomy, like, th- if those characters are more powerful than you, that that's that's still, you're really powerful. I'm placing Aang here after Korra, and above the likes of, like, Katara, Azula, um, Unlock, Tenzin, because I, I, I suppose the main question here is, why ahead of, like, Azula and Katara, and why below Korra? I placed uh, Aang below Korra because I don't think Aang is as combat focused. I think he's still a good fighter. He is, for sure. He wouldn't have survived the series. He wouldn't have been able to fight Ozai if he wasn't. Um, but it's not where his specialization lies. He he does have more emphasis on kind of spiritual techniques. And that side of him as the Avatar is kind of what's more emphasized. I, I still feel I would rate him higher than the likes of, like, Katara, who, you know, emphasizes sheer mastery over her element. Azula, again, mastery over her element. Because, um, I, again, it comes down to the fact that I think Aang is somewhere on par with Katara as a waterbender. I think Katara is better than Aang as a waterbender. But I think he can counter that with his other elements. Uh, air primarily as his kind of specialization. In that, realistically... Aang is still the best airbender on this list. Like, even if I took away everything from Aang, he probably is still just about maybe ahead of Tenzin, perhaps. 
Uh, but I think for the sake of this list, it is the other elements in addition to air that's keeping Aang above, like Tenzin and so on. I think by the end of the series, where he is in the comics right now, he has a good control over the four elements, but he still is only 14, 15, so I'm not, I don't want to go overboard with him, so I'm placing him below Korra, but ahead of some other quite notable characters here, as he is an avatar. Next, I suppose, it, it, we'll, we'll see where we place Wan. So, Ang, then Katara, then Azula, then Wan. So, Wan after Azula, but ahead of the likes of Unalak, Tenzin, Pali, Kuvira, Gazan. I, I think this is a fair one, in that I think with Wan, you have to respect the era that he came from, in that just because it was so far in the past, in or around the origin of humans getting bending that he you can't say that he is right up there with the rest of the people he, he stays on the list overall within the top 20 because he has the four elements and is a very noted master of firebending but i don't think he's quite as good as you know some of the other characters here like iro um like azula i think their kind of prodigal nature with their element is kind of makes them just about surpass um Juan, but I think the fact that he is skilled with his other three elements, even if they're maybe not on the level of other characters, um, kind of earthbending and so on, he still stays quite highly on the list. And then that means that finishing off the list is Unlock at 16, Tenzin at 17, Pali at 18, Kuvira at 19, and Gazan at 20. So this is the list of all of the known avatars included not taking into account their um, avatar state, just the fact that they're a bender of all four elements, um, and this is the kind of other list. So they're the two separate lists that you're seeing up on screen now for one including the avatar, one not including the avatar. And I think I'm very happy with how this has come out. It's a long video, but I wanted to make this one of the most detailed power rankings of characters in Avatar ever. So I put the time in, um, to make sure that I thought it all through and got it right. So, in the comments, let me know what your thoughts are on both of the lists. Um, with regards to the single elements uh, list, where do you think any character should have been placed higher, lower, or what? And then with regards to the avatars, what are your thoughts on how I approached placing them? I do think it's very difficult to like take an individual element bender list and then suddenly decide that, oh, characters with all four elements are included now. It's a very tricky thing to do, but uh, in the comments, let me know if you think anything needs to be changed or your thoughts on the list overall. So that has been the video. Thanks for watching and bye.